What's going on, everyone? This is Sherry, and you're tuning into She Said What She Said, the podcast where we talk about badass women doing amazing things in the sports world and beyond. Um, so our second episode, I want to thank everyone that listened to our first one. We had, uh, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's over 100 people between the two, the two platforms. So uh, more than I was expecting. Uh, I'm glad everyone wants to listen to us at least, at least for a few minutes. Um, so like I said, my name is Sherry. Introducing my co-host. She is a killer on the field. She's a killer on the court. Killa B, Miss Labyrinthia. Hi, guys. How's it going? Two, still rolling. Okay. Um, I can't so believe it. I, I was honestly like, I was like, man, if a couple dozen people listen to us, that would be awesome. All right. For the first show, I'm like, we right on track, but we got right. 100. What we say? 100. It's, it's closing in on 100 just on YouTube. And I think there are more people on Facebook Live. And I don't even know what Twitch is, but I know that's a thing too. Gotcha. Yeah, I have no clue. If someone can tell me what a Twitch is. Um, so that you had a busy actually. weekend, though. You had, a, you had a very busy weekend. I did. I did. I was actually out in uh, LA playing with um, a flag team called She Unit. Um, it's a team that I usually travel with, uh, not like one of my home Chicago teams. And uh, there's a big tournament in Santa uh, Clarita uh, run by the FFWCT, which is a, a big uh, national league. They run the national tournament um, mm -hmm. each year, too. And they have, you know, like little mini tournaments. And yeah, we did really well there. Um, we won the five women's non-contact and in contact, and then we uh, we lost in the championship by one in co-ed. But um, two for three isn't bad. And then she unit also won gauntlet. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't play gauntlet because it has to be um, someone from your state or surrounding states um, on one team. So like if we had a Chicago team, I could play only with the Chicago team. Um, hmm. So they had a Cali team and they played all over the Cali team and they, I coached and I filmed and I cheered from the sideline. Those are my girls, but uh, they won that too. So shout out to uh, she and you, you had some hardware. You had some personal hardware as well. I did. I did get an MVP award. Uh, <laughs> we were, we were, we were balling. I mean, it was like, I, I love that team. You know what I'm saying? We, we pick each other up. Uh, we've always got each other's back and you know, we kind of, um, we kind of went crazy on everybody this weekend. So it was, it was pretty dope. It was, I think you went crazy. Wasn't it overall MVP? Yes, it was, it was overall in contact. Um, I played both ways. Um, mm -hmm. It was a lot of games. We played 15 games total over two days. Saturday. Does that count co-ed? Yes. Oh, so God. we had five games and then five games for contact and non-contact. So my legs are done for. But, you know, take a couple days to rest. Epsom salt bath massages, you know, Man. you know the deal. You know the deal. I do. Oh, I do. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it was really, it was really fun. I got to, you know, I stayed an extra day or two to, you know, kind of hang out in LA. I saw. I saw. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a good time. We did some karaoke, and it was, it was lit. It was a really good time, and we brought home some hardware. So mm -hmm. I had a, I had a great weekend. How was your weekend, Jay? Mine was good. I was in DC. I went to a wedding on Friday because people got to do Friday weddings since everything is booked for like the next, you know, two years. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the army Navy club, a Marine Colonel was getting married and, and the Penn state uh, at Maryland football game was there. So I went to that the next day. No some no of my, uh, so I went to the wedding with my best friend from college, uh, my teammate, some of the Penn state guys were there too. So let's just say I relived college Friday night. And I nice. <laughs> So Lord, I was like, my God, I'm acting like I'm in college. I am not in college. Um, but, but I'm sure you had fun though. It's, it's nice to kind of go circle back, Lord, right? Circle Lord, back a little bit. right? Like, yeah, this is what we used to do. Oh, I can't hang. I can't hang like I used to. Man. <laughs> None of us can. Trust me. None of us can. But I did not fall down a winding flight of stairs wearing four inch heels. So... I might have been drunk, but I wasn't. I was drunk enough. I was sober enough to walk down those stairs holding the railing. Good, good. That's 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 always a plus. <laughs> uh, so we have we have quite the show today. We are paying tribute to to a, a groundbreaker, a, a legend, a, you know, a trailblazer in the in the women's gymnastics world. Um, she was unfortunately taken from us from a little bit too early this year, uh, but her 
Her husband is here. So Tom Drazzola, I know I'm pronouncing his last name wrong. Coach Tom, come and join us. Hi, hi. nice to meet you guys. Wonderful to meet you. Going? I'm hearing a little static there. Can you can you yeah. hear it? Are we good? Is it good? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we can get that taken care of. Um, so Tom, you know, there Googling your wife's name, Diane, you find all of, of these things out there and I found a, a some, something that someone said on Reddit that that really spoke to me. It was Diane walked so that Dominique Dawes could run, so that Gabby Douglas could fly, so that Simone Biles could launch a rocket ship. And I think that sums up your your wife's career. I would agree. I mean, yeah. As far as what Diane did for uh, black gymnasts, female gymnast, uh, she was the first to be the national champion and. Uh, yeah, her Olympic dream got cut short kind of because of an injury at Olympic trials, which I'm sure that's something you'll want to we'll touch on here you know, later on. But, you know, it, it took a Diane to be that national champion. So then Betty O'Kino and Dominique Dawes could take it to the next level by being in an Olympic Games. And then mm -hmm. Gabby Douglas is the one who could then win an all around championship. And then Simone Biles, I mean, the greatest of all time. So. Definitely. I mean, this is, I just want to say that it is so dope to have you here to like, I look up to women like uh, Diane and I just am ecstatic that you're here with us. And I want to learn more about her journey. So believe it or not, I had never heard before, which is, is like sad in my opinion. Um, I'm not well, being, you weren't even close to being born. Right. But she's <laughs> the first black woman yeah. <laughs> to, do this, to win a national championship. <clears throat> so. I'm just, I, it's crazy to me that I hadn't even heard of her, her name before. So Tom, if you could kind of just like touch on a little bit of her journey and like how she got started in the gymnastics world. Cause back then I know there were barely any black gymnasts, correct? That is correct. Um, she started with gymnastics when she was three years old actually. Okay. And her dad put her in recreational classes because between her and her sister, he said they were tearing up the front of the house. house I did see that. <laughs> jumping up and down. So he told uh, their mother, you know, you got to do something. So they went to Wanda's gymnastics in Gary, in Diane's hometown. And then Wanda later um, had outgrew her facility there. And then she went to Maryville, Indiana. And that's where Diane trained. That's where she learned all her basic skills. Um, she became a competitive gymnast at that gym. And then the story kind of goes, Wanda really knew Diane had a lot of talent. And then it got to the point where Wanda realized she could not coach that level of talent. So in a very courageous move, what she told Diane and her mother was, if you, you have Olympic capabilities, however, I can't coach that kind of a caliber of a gymnast. So she told her, you know, if you want to be the best you can be, you have to leave my gym. Wow. And so then so Diane started to train. Uh, she moved to in Illinois to train at gyms in Illinois at that point. Gotcha. And so she stayed at Illinois. Um, she went with Bill Sands, where she was with him for a little bit, who's in the gymnastics community. He's a legendary name for a coach. Um, and then she actually, um, she could not compete at nationals that year with him because she had broken her hand. And Bill Sands would not let her move up to the elite level because of that, because his rules were you had to, you know, basically you know, you had to compete that previous year in nationals to move up and Diane couldn't because of the injury. So she actually got mad quit for a period of time. Wow. And the next step for her after that was um, she did leave the gymnastics for a few months. Her mom took her to see one of those, uh, I think it was a Kurt Thomas exhibition tour that was coming through. And a coach appro approached her at the meet and said, or at the competition and said, you know, if you come back, you have so much talent, I could make you a national champion. And so it was Tony Ladner was his name. He was not a high profile coach at all. And Diane ended up going to train with him at Tumbling on Gymnastics. And 1981, she won the junior all around championship. Wow. And then after that was the move to Texas to train with the Crowleys. Okay. And 
82 all around junior champion again as and then 83 she moved up to the senior level and became the senior all around champion and for her that was one of her big career highlights obviously but that meet was held at uic so it was kind of nice for her it was close to home uh, her church and gary bust in I think, two or three busloads of people to go to the competition and if you you can youtube the 83 championships and at the end of the meet they um, when she won the meet, they're holding up these big signs, you know, we love Diane. And she said for her, that was kind of special to see, you know, how Gary turned out for her to see her in that meet. Absolutely. Uh, Tom, your camera is, is a little blurry again. Uh, just a quick FYI. Um, you know, one of the things that I read about that, that meet in 83 was the, the Olympic champ or sorry, the, the national champion in the, um, artist or the rhythmic gymnastics, the, the, the um I'm blanking her name but Wendy she was Hilliard. yes from Detroit she was doing their kind of performing a little bit in between the events and she actually had called her mom and said you need to drive from Detroit because this is going to be an historic moment and you know a black woman is going to win this for the first time so her mom during this meet dropped everything and drove all the way from Detroit to Chicago to witness that moment so. Yeah, and Wendy told that we had Diane's celebration of life this past weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And Wendy told that story because her mom's at, uh, is from East Chicago, okay. Indiana originally. So you know, they said that was like somebody right out of your backyard practically. So um, she said because they did compulsories the first day, and Diane, you know, was better on on the op uh, optional part of the events, and she was in a very good position after compulsory. So. Everybody kind of had a feeling because she scored well in optionals that she would win the meet. So that's why Wendy got on the phone and called her mom and said, this is history in the making. You need to get here. And her mom did. Mm -hmm. wow. Which is amazing. And Diane was only what, 14 years old? When, when she, she won? won that competition in 83, yeah, she was only 14 years old. 14 years old. Wow. That is. That's amazing. So that's Rippy, what were you doing at 14? Well, not that <laughs> not that i just started playing basketball so <laughs> oh my god um i'm just in awe though like that's that's amazing to be able to do all of that at 14 especially um i can imagine what what adversity do you do you think that diane faced at at that age being you know one of the only um black women in gymnastics um being younger i i thought i saw that she um she didn't live with her family for a while Correct. Yeah. When she first moved to Texas to train with the Carolis, um, you know, her dad was working up here at a steel mill in Gary. So she stayed with him. I mean, he stayed up here with Diane's sister, her older sister. And originally she stayed with the host family. She stayed with the Carolis for a little bit. Then they found a host family for her. Um, and then her mom did move down eventually. Um, you know, there was just a handful of black gymnasts around at that time when she was there. And that's Wendy kind of touched on that um, at Diane's Celebration of Life. You know, it was a small club. Everybody knew who everybody was. Um, Angie Dinkins <clears throat> was another black gymnast, came up just right after Diane and kind of competed with, you know, she was on the rise when Diane was winning national championships. And she was in Gary as well this past weekend. And she mentioned that, too, you know, that Diane was kind of somebody she looked up to. And I remember Diane always telling me that Angie would always ask her for her autograph. And Diane said, Diane would always tell, she told me the story, you know, Angie, she always wanted my autograph. And I was never going to give her my autograph because I was trying to beat her. So. <laughs> wow. Nice. But well, obstacle wise, I mean, she said, you know, her first big international meet was South Africa in 1981. Okay. Uh, they sent her during apartheid. Uh, apartheid. Her parents yeah. were torn on that because of the political climate. Her dad did not want her to go and talked to her mom. And her mom basically talked him into it and said, if we don't let her go on this meet, they'll probably never give her another big international assignment again. So she went um, and Diane admitted you know, she was not completely knowledgeable about the whole apartheid situation. So her mom sewed a pocket inside of her warm up and told her, if you leave your passport, as long as you're wearing this, keep your passport in here at all times. Mm -hmm. wow. And so she went to South Africa. Um, the U.S. Co coach that led the delegation didn't completely understand apartheid either because 
he took the whole delegation, the team, to a movie theater, which was segregated. So Diane went in, they were watching the movie, and all of a sudden people are throwing popcorn and candy and everything else at her. And they didn't realize what was happening until they put two and two together. It was a segregated movie theater. So at that point, then the entire U.S. team got up and walked out. Uh, to her, too, she said that one of the big thrills for her was winning that meet. Um, you know, it was her first big international meet, but to win it, she said the seating was segregated at the uh, venue. Wow. So it was like the whole, any blacks that were allowed in were sitting on one side. The white crowd was sitting on the other side. And she said when they announced she won the meet, at first, um, the black crowd stood up and cheered and the white crowd sat on their hands. But then they, they got up and cheered, too. And she said for that one moment um, to her, she felt everybody came together. So she said that kind of, you know, that gymnastics was able to squash apartheid for that one moment. Oh, wow. I mean, you hear stories about that in the U.S. happening, you know, in like the 50s. But to think of that happening in the 80s, that yeah. is definitely not something you, you would that any of us, you know would think about but that's south south africa right did she face um much racism at all in in, in america did she speak on that often or was it um you know she felt like in her sport obviously when she was coming up the ladder um definitely you know she was she was getting and some of the other when she got put into the indiana hall of fame one of the um coaches that from illinois got up and he said i have to say something you know he talked about you know that she was getting underscored at first. Um, it felt, and part of it was like her coach at the time uh, got so upset with the judges that he took an entire tray of chalk and he threw it on top of the judges on bars. <laughs> after uh, she did a, and after she did a bar routine, um, and that was Bill Sands who was her coach did that. After she did a bar routine, it, it came out and everybody was like, you know, there was there it was only the perfect ten at that point was the highest right. score mm -hmm. we could. And everybody's like, how do you even find any deductions in this routine? And they came up with like something around in, below a nine even. So that's when his, uh, her coach literally yeah. took the whole talk, the whole tray of chalk, took it, picked it up and just threw it over the judges that were on the table there. So they were covered from, you know, from their head all the way down to their waist with chalk. And so, yeah. And so now when she got to the elite level, um, you know, she, she was one of a handful of black gymnasts at the time. And the one she always said for her, she was competing to be the best. You know, she wanted to be the best. So she necessarily didn't always see the, the racism side of things when things were happening. And even when she won in 1983, you know, her goal was to be the best gymnast in this country. And she said afterwards, people came in and said, um, to her, you know, it was like, you know, what a historic accomplishment was. Then she put, you know, being the first black gymnast to win an all around championship. Then she realized the magnitude of that was even bigger than just herself, her personal goal of wanting to be the national champion. AB just commented, um, he, he put it up, what an amazing story that's movie, movie worthy. I mean, has anyone come to you about making, you know, a documentary or, or a movie about her story? Um, docu we've done, I've done some interviews for documentaries um, mm -hmm. recently as well. Diane was in the process of writing a book um, prior to okay. her passing. So that's one thing that her author, Don Emmons and myself, were kind of making sure it gets finished. Um, mm -hmm. His goal is to get it by done, ready to shop to a publisher by early next year. Um, you know, and that's not the first time somebody said this should be a movie, too. You know, they said, but yeah, it's not going to be, you know, because in many ways she was kind of for black women, for gymnastics. She was what Jackie Robinson was for baseball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a movie. I would be front row and center watching. <laughs> Let me tell yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. As a you black know, woman myself. The, 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 the the racial items in the U.S., the, the international, the items happening in South Africa, that is 
And like you were saying, that's when judging in gymnastics was a lot more subjective than it is now. I mean, it used to just be one to 10. Now they have the, de the degree of difficulty and, and all the, so they, they've definitely changed the gymnastic scoring over time. I mean, Simone Biles, you know, still gets a little bit of talking. Times too. Yes, absolutely. Um, but, it, you know, it's not on that level where you're saying like it was a flawless routine and someone gave her underneath a nine, like, you know, how, how, how is that possible? True. Yeah. You know, well, with, with Simone, what she's dealt with because she could, her difficulty is so high compared to most other gymnasts. Some of her tougher skills have been devalued too. So it's kind of right. like, because she's so much better than everybody else, try and level the playing field, I guess, on the international community they basically devalued some of her skills too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the things we did here was, you know, Diane and Mary Lou Rutten were both kind of a different type of gymnast. They were the first to introduce power gymnastics for women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were the kind of gymnasts today under the current code, they would have excelled with the type of gym, uh, their gymnastics. It was the code, the current code, was written for gymnasts like them, which is similar to right. Simone as well. So. And and they have the trampoline bounce back floors now, which they they didn't you know have in the eighties. Yeah, and the horse has a lot more spring. To, believe me, Diane would always talk about yeah. Uh, <laughs> the beam, yeah, the beam was a little bit more. It was she goes. I grew up on that wood beam. I grew up you know with oh, mats yeah. put on, mats mm -hmm. thrown onto a you know over a gym floor. And she goes trying you know there weren't spring floors all the time either. So. Yes, I always she used to make those stories quite clear to the kids how much better they have it today than they had it back when she competed. Yeah, and and yeah, what she would have been able to do if if they had those uh, you know those floors and and those vaults. That's Absolutely. true. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. So, so, so you know, you you brushed on the, the the of her missing her Olympic dreams, and. Um, you want to share a little bit more about about that story of, of what happened in, in 84? Yeah. Um, so the yeah. trials came around in 84 in Jacksonville. Um, you know, top six gymnasts, I think they the, the top two or three were guaranteed a spot on the team. Mm -hmm. And then there would be a training camp to pick the rest of the team. Uh, Diane was in sixth place after the first night. Um, it looked like, once again, you know, the top six were going to go to that camp. Um, it looked like she was sitting in a good spot because with optionals coming up, that would be her strength. Um, she advanced up with one event to with her next to last event was a vault mm -hmm. and she landed a little short and she sustained an ankle injury. And this is where the controversy starts to settle in. Um, you know, she was told at that point, you know, your spot in the training camps assured you do not need to finish this meet. Well, lo and behold, so she scratches. And Bella at that time had, you know, Mary Lou Retton at the meet. He also had sure. Julianne McNamara with him at the time. So Bella was kind of bouncing from gymnast to gymnast. And Diane scratched, which was her last event, was bars. Um, and then when the meet's over, they come back and say, well, you're not going to go to training camp. And she's like, you know, well, you know, I was told I could go. And their line was, well, no, but you didn't finish the meet. And so they did go through this whole process of petitioning. Um, and ultimately what happened with her, the petition was declined. Uh, and the ruling was because she didn't compete in world championships in 1983 due to an injury. Um, she couldn't petition to the training camp because she didn't finish the Olympic trials. And she said, if somebody, she always said, if somebody had told me, because all she needed to score on bars to advance to the training camp was a 0.24. So below one, wow. you know, with, you know, so you're figuring you're that close and you did one less event than everybody. Um, so with her, what she did was, you know, she said, if somebody had told me all I needed to do was get in under, I could have done a bar routine and not even done a dismount and scored ab above that easily. Right. She could have swung around it a few times and, yeah. you know, just gracefully stepped off the lower one to one foot and walked away. Yeah. So that's what kept her off the Olympic team. Now, you know, talking with her through the years on this, she always felt there was kind of a double whammy. You know, she wasn't sure in time, you know, was America ready for a black gymnast to be on the women's team? So that yeah. was part of it. 
um, or not America maybe, but the powers to be that were okay. behind picking that team. Um, but she also felt there was a whammy against her too because her coach um, was considered an outsider at the time because he was new on the American scene, Bella Carolla. Right. And if Diane had been on that team, uh, she would have been the Corolla gymnast on that team. Right. Wow. And so, and Bella was not the Olympic coach at that point. Um, it was Don Peters out of Scats in California. And so by Diane not being picked for that team, Don Peters got a gymnast on the team. Mm. And so mm -hmm. Don Peters ended up with four gymnasts. Diane uh, Corolla ended up with two instead of three. And you know, the rest, you know, draw your own conclusions on that. But, you know, those are that's things that ran through her head as well. Gotcha. You know, it, it sounds feasible. Um, I, I, Tom, have you listened to the 30 for 30 podcast on Caroli? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I actually had listened to that um, earlier this year over the summer when I was doing my long distance runs and um it was very interesting, and, and this take I can see because Caroli definitely butted heads a lot with the governing bodies of, of there. Um, and you know, and now it, it seems like some of Caroli's training tactics, you know, a little bit more controversial. How did how did she get along with Bella and, and his wife? Diane, um, the one thing with Diane is that she has nothing but good things to say about her time with Bella. Mm -hmm. Um, she felt, you know, Bella was hard, but she said she would have never excelled to the level she did without his coaching. Mm -hmm. um, she would always compare Bella to going to play basketball for Bobby Knight. Okay. Mm -hmm. and she said, you know, it's like to her, you know, like you knew what you were getting into if you went to play basketball for Bobby Knight. She said the same thing. If you went to go train with Bella, you knew it was going to be hard. Mm hmm and so she felt, you know, so to her, she had no complaints about it. Um, you know, the whole Bella thing with her, I mean, she, like I said, you know, she did stay in touch with him, you know, obviously not as much, you know, as they got older, but when they ran into each other, they were always very friendly to each other. I mean, I've met him myself several times and with Diane um, and she did professional tours. Bella would be, you know, a guest at the tours as well. So you know, they did stay in contact with each other through the years. Um, you know, Bella was the more the face of the coaching when Diane competed. Mark was in the background always in her time period. So, I mean, she just, like I said, she felt he was demanding, but, um, you know, she did not feel like there was any type of, you know, definitely no physical abuse or mm -hmm. psychological abuse at all when she coached. She just said it was, he was, you know, hard, but he, he was hard on everybody. It wasn't like he played favorites. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I wanted to touch on, you said that um, after the ankle injury, you know, she did an advance and she retired shortly after that, correct? She retired um, in 1985. Yeah. After the Olympics, um, she did go back, um, had healed and was, and was training again. And the deal she had with the, the Corollas at that time, what she was going to take, because they, you know, about 1988. And, you know, nowadays, yes, gymnasts could definitely, she'd have only been 20 years old. So, you know, that's, you know, yeah. Simone's 24 right now. Um, but back in that era, you know, there wasn't the money, you couldn't take money back then. Or if you did, you lost your amateur status. And that also knocked you out of, um, you know, competing in Olympics. So she did take it one year at a time. She got injured in 85. She injured her ankle again. Um, right before USA Championships, and then she retired after that from competitive. She did go on and tour. Um, she did professional tours with primarily with Bart Connor and Paul Zirk. Um, she did gymnastics tours with them and um, television specials all the way into the early 2000s. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Diane did get to the Olympics. It just wasn't how we, how we, how she had hoped to be. Um, she actually auditioned to perform in the closing ceremonies of the Barcelona Olympics in 1992, and she got selected. Mm -hmm. And there oh, is a, okay. yeah, there, she was a performer in that. And that's kind of a, after she retired from gymnastics, she did professional dance and did the professional gymnastics shows. So the audition in Chicago, this is a story you'll probably find interesting. Um, so she was, they took one dancer out of Chicago at the audition. So she comes into the audition and she said there was, you know, 
couple hundred people there easily. And they all knew in advance they're taking one person. And so what they told her is she was sitting there during her audition. She's thinking, I have to do something to make my stick myself stick out from everybody else. So while she was doing her audition, there was a table um, there with the people who were the selection group and they were seated at it. And so right at the end of her audition, she was wearing character shoes, which are dance shoes. Uh, she did, she ran, took off and did a double fold. Now this was on a floor, no spring floor, mind you, a dance floor. Did a double fold over the table of those individuals and stuck the landing behind them. So you get figured that's, you know, seven years removed from professional, um, from competing, you know, as an elite gymnast. And she mm-hmm. stuck the landing. She said the room just got silent. Nobody said anything. Uh, they finished, everybody in the room at that point knew, okay, this is going to be the one. Um, and <laughs> I'm when sure. They, and when they finished, she was the one. Now, if you kind of go fast forward a few years later, um, we were out to eat one night. We were waiting to be seated at a restaurant. And Diane was wearing, we had went to see a Cirque du Soleil show. So she was wearing a Cirque jacket. And a woman comes up to her and says, hey, are you a performer in Cirque? And Diane's like, no, no. She goes, I just got this when the show was here in Chicago. And so she goes, well, you look like you could have been a dancer. And she goes, you know, I was. I did some professional shows. And they talked back and forth. Um, And then she goes, well, what shows were you in? And then Diane told her, you know, she rattled off a couple of shows. Then she said the 1992 um, Barcelona Olympics closing ceremonies. And the woman, all of a sudden, her eyes went bing. Her mouth opens up and she goes, you're her, aren't you? And Diane's kind of like, you know, kind of like, her what? And she goes, you did that tumbling pass over the table in character shoes. And Diane's like, she goes, well, yeah, and she goes, you're an urban legend in the Chicago dance community. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's so awesome. I'm sure she definitely made a statement. How could you, how could you forget that, right? That, yeah, yeah, I can imagine no. that. <laughs> so um, I also read that Diane did start a dance school here in Chicago. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, after coaching around, like, um, we got married in 1994. Um, so in 1996, she opened her own gym, Skyline Gymnastics, in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And what ends up happening for her was, um, with Skyline, it was on the north side of Chicago, like right across from Wells Park. Oh, okay, that's yeah, by me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she stayed o- open for almost 17 years there. And then she ended up closing the gym after that. And then after the gym closed, she did work at a couple of clubs. She freelanced and she judged. Um, Diane was a Brevet rated judge as well with the sport. So she did judge like USA um, championships, uh, Olympic trials. So she judged all the way. And then plus, you know, dozens and hundreds of just local JL meets as well. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And your camera went out fuzzy again. I know. So. I just, it's one of those. I don't know okay. what's happening to it. <laughs> just want to get your nice, your nice smile on here. No. Can, so can you tell us a little bit about you guys before you, when you met, before you were Yeah, married? yeah, this is what you I want to hear about. You skated past that, but we want to go back, we want to circle back. We want to go back to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, how'd you guys meet, you know, tell, tell us about your guys' that. relationship. Okay, she moved here in 1992. Um, she had, right after she actually had finished performing at Barcelona, and she said she was tired of the whole dance routine because, you know, it would be, you land a gig, it's over, then it's audition. And she in the travel and it's just kind of a it's a tough life, you know. And so she decided she was going to settle down. She went back to coaching at a gym in Chicago on the north side, Lakeshore Academy. Um, and at that point, she was out one night in 1992 in the fall. And I was out and we just met and started talking to each other. And the next thing that happened was, you know, we started to see each other and like about six months after we met, we actually got engaged, and then we got married about a year and a half later. So. Wow, okay, six you months. Quick. Yeah, you so when you know, you know, right? <laughs> That's right. You know when you know, and and she was also like, and she said at that point she was looking to to settle down to, and her line to me at the point was, uh, her love would only last for a year, so you better decide if you want to be with her for the rest of your life or not. So. <laughs> Wow, she knows what she knew what she wanted. Yeah, oh, man. 
did you guys face any any racism or issues being an interracial couple at all in that time? Uh, yeah, here and there, yes. Yeah, occasionally we did, yes. You know, but it, nothing, you know, that was, you know, you, you know, something you expect to deal with, but nothing, you know, over the top, I guess, would be the way to describe it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And did uh, did ever anyone ever get like starstruck? Did do people recognize her a lot? Um. If we were at any gymnastics type events, yes. Okay. Um, you know, when she would walk into a room, anything with the big gymnastics, because she was still a well-known name and all the way, obviously, even still. Um, she's a known name and people would recognize her. Um, it, just being out locally inside of Chicago randomly, yes. But for the most part, you know, we could pretty much, you know, go, you know, she didn't have to worry about that type of thing. But if it was related to gymnastics, yes, she would be, you know, she would have people you want to take a picture, which she accommodated all that, you know, and especially for kids, um, you know, her autographs. And and she would always ask me, like, you know, the same thing here as an example, like, you know, well, you know, how do young kids know who she is? And it's and I finally I said, Diane, you got to realize it's their parents because their parents know who you are. So they're steering them to you. That's why that's how it was happening, too. So. I can imagine just especially a, like, like I said, being a black girl, uh, I'm just like an ought to be the first like, you know, I played sports, but I was, you know, I'm nowhere near the first. So to be the like the first black woman to win, I can. That means so much to young black girls. I'm sure it was, you know, mm-hmm. even to me reading about her it meant so much to me. So I can only imagine what um, yeah. what it was like for sure. So, yeah, so, I mean, she would, I mean, so, so the answer that it wasn't, you know, like if anything gymnastics related, yes, you would have like, a, it was the first time I went with her to Caroli's gym. She stopped by to visit, to say, we were in Houston. So she stopped by to say hello to Bella and Marta. Um, and then another time we went in there, she had to train because she, she wanted to work out because she was getting ready to do a professional show. And so she was trying to, you know, get back in, you know, at least get back into professional show shape. Um, so we walked into Crowley's gym and it was like, people would be like, oh, there's Diane Durham. And they'd say, well, there's a bodyguard. It must be. Well, that was, I was, her, I, I was not the bodyguard. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, so what's one thing, you know, if, if you're thinking about her as a person, at, you know, for her personality, what words would you use to, to describe her? But she loved life. That was the one thing. And she loved to laugh. Um, one of the things that people have talked about was her unique laugh, um, you know, and how she was definitely somebody who loved life, uh, even though she didn't get the ultimate goal that she wanted with that Olympics um, for whatever reasons. Um, you know, that did not define her as a person, um, you know, and even the respect she had in the gymnastics community, regardless of not making the Olympics. Um, showed out this past weekend. I mean, four members of the 84 team came back to see somebody that was not their Olympic teammate, but was their national team teammate. Um, there was a, you know, and Angie Denkins was on the national team. She came back. Mary Lou Retton was scheduled to be here, but unfortunately um, she was, she was sick, so she could not make it, you know, but she, and she was very upset. She couldn't make it because she said, you know, if anybody should have been there, it should have been her. Um, and so, but obviously circumstances wouldn't allow that. So she did send something that we did have read as well. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, that, and then other people from the Federation where there are USA gymnastics sent two representatives to the event. Um, you know, so it was well turned out. I think people respected her as a gymnast, but people also, you know, respected her as a person. And they always, they, that was one of the stories that come common threads that came out, you know, is that Diane was such a unique individual. You know, they said there was only one Diane and that was part of it. You know, always, you know, the life, of, you know, as far as full of energy, lively, positive, and that was her. Tell us a little bit more about the, yeah, the, tell us a little bit more about the celebration of life. I, I read about it on ESPN actually, um, to, just to show the importance of it, but, but tell us a little bit more about that event. Well, it was something, obviously, you know, when, when Diane passed away, we could not do anything um, because of COVID. Okay. 
So her sister and myself um, wanted to do something bigger. So, you know, friends, the gymnastics world, relatives that couldn't be back there in February could have a chance to celebrate Diane. And so we were, you know, going back and forth on where to hold this event. And we decided to hold it in Gary at Westside High School. And that was right across the street from where she grew up. We felt, first of all, you know, Diane grew up in Gary and she wasn't one of those people that said, oh, I'm from Chicago, even though I'm not. You know, <laughs> right. Suburban people do that a lot too in, in Illinois. But, yep, yep. Um, <laughs> so, but so she said, you know, she would always say, I'm from Gary, Indiana. And so we kind of made it a point that this would be nice, kind of come full circle and end with Gary as well for her, for a big celebration of life. And the Gary School District and the city of Gary worked with us quite a bit for that. Um, and so we were able to hold the event at Westside High School. Um, and they did a wonderful job in the theater there. Um, and as far as the plan we had out, we invited a lot of people. And the ones that could not be there, like Simone Biles was still on tour, but she sent a video. And so did Gabby Douglas sent us a video. Um, some of her other colleagues, Bart Connor and Nadia Coleman each were, they've been dear friends of Diane. Diane was, did tours with Bart ever since 85. Um, so they, they were not, they had a previous commitment, but, um, so they sent us a video, but also Bart and Nadia's business manager who ran the tours and was Bart's former coach. He was there as well in person. So it's, so it was very nice. You know, people got a chance to laugh and cry. Um, they got a chance to share memories. Um, and they got a chance to celebrate the life of Diane. So. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Can you tell us what do you think is the biggest um, impact that Diane had um, as as a person, as a gymnast? Like, what what legacy you left behind? Well, as a gymnast, obviously, I think you know, as far as kind of being a pioneer or a trailblazer for Black female gymnasts, definitely. Um, you know, one of the stories that we took that Diane opened the door. So a Betty Okino and a Dominique Dawes could walk through it. Then later on, Gabby Douglas ran through it. And then Simone Biles flew through that door. Mm -hmm. You know, and Simone definitely said, you know, as far as what Diane did for her is something that she, you know, as far as her and other black gymnasts is something that does not go unnoticed. And Betty Okino said that in her video as well. You know, everybody talks about who won the medals and who was the first to do this. But she also said, you have to look at who is the first to open the door. That's more important. And she said that was Diane. So definitely. as a person, definitely like some of our, one of her former gymnasts, um, we asked to speak as well. And she talked about, you know, their relationship was beyond gymnastics because they stayed in touch all the way, you know, until Diane passed away. They would still stay in touch with each other. Um, and she always felt that Diane was like a second mother to her, which is what a lot of the gymnasts that she had it felt through the time as well they always felt diane was kind of you know you could she would be somebody that would kind of keep you on track as far as gymnastics but also she would to her it was also to be a better person was just as important for her gotcha. definitely it's beautiful yeah. i know <laughs> very touching um yeah. what what have you felt that you you've learned from your wife that you'll that you'll take on with you well, I mean, one thing is obviously you, her positivity is something, you know, to always find something positive. And that's like um, one of the things Kelly Garrison wrote a letter and she said, you know, how Diane could be one of the most positive people you ever know, considering what happened to her gymnastics wise. That just shows if you, if you look to find that one, if you can always find something positive, that makes your day in your life better, too. Even though when it's yeah, at your lowest low. If you can find something, you know, to think that something went well at that point, then you've done something good. So I think that that would be something to live on, you know, and the big thing she would always say is um, that when she would always talk to people, they always several people brought that up um, is that she would always end a conversation. Make sure you take care of you. That's how she would always tell it to people. Oh, I love that. I love that. I feel like we get kind of lost in the sauce often mm -hmm. so, and we forget about ourselves, especially with everything going on, trying to help other people out. So I, I love that statement. I think I'm going to use that a little bit moving forward. <laughs> right. Get that one a little tattooed mm -hmm. on you or something. <laughs> Definitely. Maybe. <laughs>
Is there anything else that you think that the world needs to know um, about Diane that you want to? No, I mean, I think we all, obviously if there's other topics, but um, you know, the one thing that they have done is um, they did set up, they're going to a Diane Durham humanitarian award. And that was set up by Paul Zert, who was a Bar Connors business manager. He set that up and he started it as a GoFundMe fundraiser. I think it's still up actually too. And, you know, his goal was initially to raise $10,000 and he was going to, he's rolling it into a 501c3. And then that way you can get tax deduct tax deductions to donate to it. Corporate money will be more coming into it and to have an annual award to somebody who has overcome adversity, um, whether it's through injuries, um, you know, personal issues, well, social emotional issues in the gymnastics world. And to name that award, you know, an annually somebody receives that award. And our plan right now is to have the recipient, the first one picked and announced at the NCAA champion women's gymnastics championships in Fort Worth, wow. Texas in April. So right. now he started at 10,000 um, and then it hit 10,000 very quickly. Um, and then he raised the goal up to 30,000 thinking we'd never hit 30,000 and now it's over 35,000. So it's done quite well. I mean, a lot of people, you know, have, you know, obviously contributed, whether it's $5, $10 or $2,000 people have contributed. So it's, so it's remarkable. And that's a yearly award. It will year become a yearly award. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. That's amazing. And is that for uh, collegiate gymnasts or high school or professional? It could be, you know, it could be anybody. It could be a collegiate gymnast. It could be somebody that's in the elite program, you know, or somebody who's retired from the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so the criteria for that is pretty wide open. It could be somebody, okay. you know, you're recognizing, you know, kind of somebody in a situation like Diane, you want to recognize them for some you know, what they have dealt with, you know, in their career or post-career type situation too. So. Well, that's fantastic. Okay. I mean, yeah. what a legacy, you know, just, and, and the fact that, you know, you, Tom, are working on this book, you, you've done the celebration of life, that just shows how much, how much love <laughs> that, you know, that, that you have for her and, you know, what, what an amazing life partner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, you know, is for me, it's like, man, if I can, you know, I would love to have, you know, if I ever to pass too early, I'd love to have a husband that was like you, that was just doing everything you can to continue that legacy and, you know, sharing her with the world. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was one thing I you was, know, you know, I mean, it is, you never expect to lose somebody at that young of an age and sadly it happened. So. I mean, it isn't, you know, myself, but it's also a lot of people in the, the gymnastics world and family and friends um, have wanted to make sure, you know, to preserve Diane's legacy, to make sure future generations would know who was the first. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, we thank you so much for, for taking this time to speak with us. Um, you know, when that book comes out, Make sure you tell Terrence because I will I will have that one pre-ordered. Uh, all the stories that you've told have been incredible, and you know I'd love to really just dive in. I, I read a lot, so I would just love to read a, a full book about her life. Um, you know, even from this conversation and and the the research that I did before, I feel like I know her. You know, and I feel like I would have wanted to have met her. Um, mm -hmm. It just yeah. seems like she was just such a memorable memorable person for. For, you know, and not just from what she did, you know, in competition, but who she was as a person uh, outside of competition as well. Yeah. Well, and one thing too, like when I met Diane, I didn't know what she had done gymnastically and she never mm -hmm. like, told me at first either. Doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and, and so I knew she was coaching gymnastics, but I didn't know what her background was. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of funny. It was like we had dated for, you know, several weeks and then um she told me at the time she goes you know oh this next weekend i i'm i'm, I'm gonna be out of town so we won't be able to get together and i'm like okay and then she, and she said i've got a gymnastics show i have to be at and i was kind of i must have given her a look like 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 what and then she, because she said you know i'm gonna be in a show with bar connor and she goes do you know who bar connor is and i said well yeah because i went to college in oklahoma so i knew who bar connor was because in the okay. early 80s 
it was Bart Connor and Billy Sims in Oklahoma. You know, and Oklahoma is a big football state. So for Bart Connor to be on Billy Sims level, you know, you have to be pretty darn good. And he was, you know, so he was, you know, three time Olympian. Um, so then I must be like, like, what is she talking about? Look on my, on my face because she said, well, do you know who Bella Caroli and Mary Lou Retton are? And I was like, yes. And then as and she goes, well, Bella was my coach and Mary Lou was my teammate. And so I'm thinking like, wow, what is she trying to tell me here? So and then, now, this, was before, this was before cell phones. This was before, you know, home computers, anything like that. So I had to wait until I went to work the following Monday to have a chance. Now, this is before Google, mind you. So whatever search engine was out there, I ran it out and ran her name across it. And I came back and I was like, wow. I mean, I was blown away. And then <laughs> so when I did, and then she did tell me later, she goes, that that was one thing that really, you know, she goes, it gained you a ton of points because you actually like me for me, not because of who I, what I have done. Mm -hmm. wow. Amazing. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you, Tom. No, you're we welcome. We appreciate it. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll be looking out for that book and, you know, I, my heart goes out to you. I know it's a difficult time for you, um, but you know you you have a lot of people in your corner, um, and us being two of them as well. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. It's like, that's what helps. You know, obviously, I'd be lying if I said this was easy, but you know, hearing the support and hearing the the stories and the memories and how people looked up to Diane and that impact that does make it easier. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm glad to hear. Glad to hear. Thank you so much for honoring Diane. Yeah. And hopefully, like they said, maybe a movie soon, maybe a documentary. Mm -hmm. I'm not much of a reader, but if the book comes out, I would definitely <laughs> read. Okay, so audio, <laughs> audio <book>. movie. <laughs> yeah, the movie. The movie, movie for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love the real life aspect of movies, how you kind of feel like you're there with them. So that would definitely okay. be Yeah. Well, hopefully, I mean, yes, hopefully a movie and we'll see what happens. I know there was a they were they were filming. Um, there was a lot of interviews. People gave a lot of interviews because um, at West Side this weekend, because there was a documentary crew out there. They're doing a documentary on black women in gymnastics, actually. And Diane, of course, is one of the one of the featured gymnasts in that. So they were sure. really capturing, um, pulling in. It was a great opportunity for that production company. It's through Sony. Um, they were able to get a lot of people there at one spot to interview them instead of having to go track all over the country. So, you know, they were able to really do a lot of work in a short period of time with that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. On that no, note. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, you have a good night, Tom. All right, you guys take care. Thanks so much. Bye. Tom. Okay. Uh, I got a little choked up there. I know. I was like getting a little quiet and when he like, starts oh. with her legs. And I'm like, okay, hold it together, B. Hold it together. Tighten up. Come on. Tighten up. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome though. Like to just to even learn about who she was besides the gymnast. Seems like mm -hmm. she was a great person. I'm just in awe. Like it's 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 tragic that I, I had never even heard of. I almost feel like <laughs> it's my fault that I feel ashamed. I don't but, think um, so. I mean, you know, th these are these stories that people don't necessarily hear about, right? Especially because you weren't a gymnast. Um, exactly. And, you know, the we, gymnastics we hear were about Mary Lou Rett and, and, you know, Gadley Douglas and, and all those women. But, but yeah, and just kind of reading some of the comments that, like, that what Mary Lou Rett had said about her, mm -hmm. um, you know, even recently, it's like, wow, like, this is, you know, the golden girl of the 84 Olympics who, you know, considers this, this person that, that she, you know, still holds on to. And that's, those Olympics were 37 years ago. I know because I was born that year. Um, and so, you know, to have someone from 37 years ago that you still hold so dearly in your heart just, just shows how, how special she was. Yeah. yeah. And to be the first black woman, you know, I'm all for. Ah, <laughs> you know, it's two weeks in a row. Barriers. I know, That's right? The row we've had the first, first it's black woman thing. It's a beautiful thing, and it's important to me. And I'm sure it's important to other other girls, but just for young black girls, I think it's it's super important to see people that look like us, um, you know, making strides and you know, um, leaving legacies behind, such as mm -hmm. this one. So, absolutely, definitely, someone definitely. has to be the first to open that door. Um, 
to, to let someone else come in. Um, yes, Terrence, that, that was inspirational. Um, well, yeah. B and I are going to, we're going to gather our thoughts and we're going to do a quick commercial break and then we'll we will lighten the mood a little bit. Yes. So take us away, T. Tranquility. Trey Bella. Alleviate the stress of your day. A fresh approach to nail care service at the top of the pampering scale. Awaken your senses with no chemical smells. Relax. We're at your service with professional, personalized treatments. Enjoy a manicure or pedicure tailored to you. Trey Bella Nail Spa. 10349 South Halstead in Chicago. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Trey Bella Nail Spa or book at TreyBellaNailSpa.com. We are back. All right. Hey, where did our background go? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Someone has to keep an eye on that man. All right. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, because we, we'd like to have a, a kind of a topic after our, our interviews because she said what she said. Both both you and I have a lot to say. And I was thinking of, of what topic I wanted to, you know, to discuss, especially after having kind of that, that deeper guest. I was like, I need something a little bit lighter here. Um, and when I was in DC over the weekend, you know, I was with my college best friend. And again, I graduated in 06. This is whatever year. That is still one of my best friends in the world. And so I wanted to talk about the evolution of female friendships, you know, adult female friendships. It's really it's something new. You know, my mom is going to be 70 next year. When she was in college, you went to college to get an MRS degree, right? The other women were maybe your like competition to get the men, you know, the frenemies. It, it was like you get your husband, you get your kids. That is your center. And it's like now, I, you know, girls trips are like uh, everything. <laughs> it's everything, right? I mean, we go to college to make mm -hmm. friends. Like who wants this guy at our college? And so that was kind of my topic. Like I want to talk about having, you know, female friends as an adult, how, how we make friends and how we keep them. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's definitely, I think, a a newer thing as well. Um, my, I, I want to say my mom, growing up, had she still has the same best friend. I call her my aunt, and mm -hmm. they've been friends since they were like thirteen. But that's it. <laughs> that's her closest friend. Um, she's other friends, you know, they come and go. The friendships don't last. But she's only got one friend, and I'm like, mom, how do you only have one friend from <laughs> your childhood? She is fifty five. Oh, mom's young. Yeah, she's 55. Um, well, I mean, you're also a lot younger than me. <laughs> yes, T, an MRS degree. That that was a thing. <laughs> um, I just made 30, okay? So I'm, I'm yeah, good. Right. Um, exactly. But yeah, I was just saying that I think I think the women women friendships are, are newer. Um, like at least groups of friends. Um, because like you said, um, women weren't, you know, going places to make friends. And I feel like a lot of society have like have kind of trained us to like be against each other. And I feel like we're mm -hmm. starting we're starting to come back and you know join sisterhood and and go on these girls trips. Um, and I think I think it's super super important to have like a tribe of like of women that you can talk to about anything um, that you know you guys can bounce ideas off and everything. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big tribe, you know, some, some people like it, like it's small, you know, they keep their circle small, but it's definitely important to, um, to have at least a few people who you can confide in and vent to and, you know, even gossip with or talk trash, you know what I mean? But I think, I think it's just important to have some, some people around you, like your people besides your mm -hmm. significant other. Um, my That's tribe, crazy. I love them to death. You know what I mean? Like I got my football girls, I got my college girls, you know, and I got my, my, you know, my high school best friend and even like friends from when I was younger, you know, when you, when you keep those friends around, it's just like having those different walks of life around you. I think that, that, you know, just only contributes to your life. Um, I definitely think that we, female friendships, it's, 
it's definitely um, a, a necessity, I would say. It is. It is. It is. It is. I, re I, read I read a book a, book a few book years ago. ago. Oh, is that me? Uh, I read a book a few years ago. It's called Text Me When You Get Home. My sister loaned it to me. And it's really, it was someone actually studying the evolution of female friendships, of, of how this is such a new concept, right? Text me when you get home. Like, mm -hmm. this is a little girl thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, guys yeah, do don't do that at all. <laughs> no, they're like, oh, wh where did he go? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> right. Uh, hold on, let me mute unmute hopefully that'll take away that feedback um i personally am a friend collector like i have friends from college friends from high school friends from football friends from here i just kind of collect everyone mm -hmm. and so if, if i have like a like a like my, my birthday brunch my ladies one i mean there's people are always going to meet each other i don't know i just kind of like collect friends and i feel like you're kind of the same way too definitely i actually just saw a meme and it was like um showing um one person in super different rooms and it's like me and all of my different circle of friends. So it's like, I'm like, I can totally relate to that because I have diff a different group of friends. Like I can go and hang with the, you know, the nerds, the smart kid, not the nerds, the smart kids, the, <laughs> the smart people, you know, the people from work, the people from football. So yeah, it's definitely, um, I think it's, it keeps you rounded to have that different group of friends, not, not have, you know, women who are always, you know, who are just like you all the time. Mm -hmm. I, think it, I think it definitely helps uh, keep me uh, well-rounded. And you don't want people that just agree with you on everything you say. Dear Lord, my girlfriends, if I'm making bad decisions or questionable decisions, they will be the first to let me know. You need that. Sometimes you need that. You need somebody to check you every now and again. And you need to be, you need to have that honest friend. I'm that friend for my group. and. I, I also saw another meme. Your honest, your meanest friend is a friend that cares about you the most. Facts. I like to say that because they they're honest with you and they just want to make sure you're straight. And that's that's just my my opinion on you know why I'm so brutally honest with my friends. Now I'm still gonna spare their feelings best way I can, but I'm gonna, of course, it's, it's gonna keep it a buck. Like exactly. I'm gonna keep it a buck so they know where I stand and not and I, I'll be that friend to tell you like, nah, check yourself. <laughs> You need that. I think every I think every group needs that. And if if that got to be the bad guy, sometimes I got to be the bad guy. But you know, I care about you, and I just want to make sure that you shit straight. My friends, if I trip, they'll laugh at me. Yeah, I'm that friend too. <laughs> I'm that friend. I will clown you. Um, jokes for days. Um, Man. Yeah. Man, Man. So how would you? Yeah. You, you know, we we talk about our friends right we're both so popular but i mean a lot of our friends come from sports worlds yeah. like if you were moving to a new city like let's just say you upped and moved to i don't know miami or or charlotte or something what steps would you take to to create kind of a new circle because i think that's a lot of people struggle with right you move you move somewhere and you're like oh yeah okay I would probably join a sports league. <laughs> to be honest with you, some kind of rec league um, mm -hmm. or something like that. Because, I mean, I've never, I've never really had problems in there, like making friends. But that's because I'm always around people that play sports. Even when I moved to Chicago, I instantly started playing. You know, in the Chicago flag football. Right. Yeah. Shout out to A2. Um, <laughs> it was CBL back then, but I started that, and then now some of those those people are some of my best friends. So I mm -hmm. think I would, I would definitely join, you know, something, something that keeps you active and kind of, you know, socialize from there. Uh, what advice what would you give? Said. Yeah. So what advice would you give to someone that maybe didn't play sports? Join something, <laughs> join something, whatever you're into cooking, uh, a cooking class, yoga, um, it doesn't have to be something active. You, join, you know, whatever you're into, join something. And then once you find something, to find a group of people who have kind of the same interests as you and it's kind of history from there you know you guys click on that one interest and then you know you go out and you meet people um yeah i would just say you got to be out and about though to find mm -hmm. to yeah find your friends, friends aren't going to come into your new yeah they're not going to come into your living room yeah significant you. others you gotta you gotta be out you gotta put yourself out there so i would definitely say 
get out there and get involved in something, whatever your interest may be. I think Bumble has a yeah. friend finder. Bumble, which one's Bumble? Bum, wait, Bumble is the one where the, yes, but it's the, the one where the, to, the girl has to the guy, but I believe they actually have a friend finder app mm -hmm. on there as well. Which would be kind of cool. Like you could, you know, if you move somewhere new, you could just kind of swipe through and like go on friend dates. Yeah. Would you ever do something like that? I would. I mean, I'd make sure it's safe. I, I just like doing crazy off the wall shit. Yeah, I, I feel like I would too. too, too. <laughs> I would totally do that if I was bored one day. Because um, with having so many like friend groups and you know playing on sports teams, you you're used to being around people. I'm a super, mm -hmm. I would say this, like, I have a love-hate relationship with people. Like, I love to be around people, but, like, I hate the things that people do. <laughs> I hate that, what people are. Um, but I, I, I would say that being in those big groups all the time, I, I'm not used to being by myself. So mm -hmm. on a day where I'm like, okay, you know, I'm lonely, uh, my friends are busy or, you know, whatever. I just feel like doing something, something new, something, meeting someone new. Some, I'm always up to do i've always said i'll try anything twice the first time you can't you can't really tell facts, facts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's got to be twice you don't like it after twice you know for sure um so i would definitely definitely be open to that as long as it's it's safe and like probably you know an open area a public area so that nothing crazy goes down but yeah i would definitely, def yeah, definitely i feel like i, I would do it like i wouldn't would. yeah I, i'd be like yeah this is actually a a good idea um I, I mean, I, I read it and I, I think it's still around. I was like, that's actually a genius idea, right? Because people use apps to find a significant other. Why not get it to, to get some new people? Um, I'll tell you what, when you're talking about out and about, man, COVID was hard as shit for me. I do not do well sitting at home. I was and, struggling. Uh, I'm sure. I was yeah. struggling. And that, being, being around people, you have to be out. So when we couldn't be out and I mean, people were trying to be safe too. They had, you know, of course, and we children. So we, people were actually, you know, following the rules and kind of trying to stay apart and kind of doing, you know, everything virtual. And it definitely took a toll. It definitely took a toll. When you're, when you're an extrovert and you're used to being out and you're outgoing and like to be around people. Um, COVID was really, really tough for me. Um, yeah. So it was I, like, yeah. I got so irritated like on like a, a work call for like a women's group thing in my job they were they, they, they were talking about like um like oh like name something you're grateful for for 2020 <laughs> and it was like everyone's like oh it's just so great to have time to reflect and time and i'm like well, i'm like fuck all of y'all i hated 2020 there was literally nothing that good that came out of it like i did not want any of that time i didn't want to spend extra time with my family i wanted none of this i don't want to be positive like don't make me be positive when the world's on fucking fire um so yeah um I got a no. cat. That's how bored I was. I, I went and got a damn cat. <laughs> Man, I, I feel like we're one of the same on that. I definitely feel. Yeah. I was, it, it, I was not honestly, it turned me off. Like when people try to make you do that forced positive, like, oh, name something you're grateful for for 2020. Like I like didn't want to participate anymore with, with that group because it was like. <laughs> you like forget that shit. No, this is not a good year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I got nothing positive. Like, can I just be negative as shit? Like, I don't know. Um, and say what it is. That's just yeah, man. Said, right? <laughs> Look at T doing Terrence, dating apps. Terrence coming up. So, wait, is he asking us the dating apps is a no? He's I asking mean, us if, if, that's your, if that's what floats your boat, go crazy. You know what I'm saying? They, I, I have never been on dating apps at all. And But I mean, if that's what you're into. Oh, oh, I've used I've used them, and I think that I mean, same with anything. Like I'm one of those people that if I'm like at a bar with friends, I don't want to talk to strangers, so I don't do very well with meeting <laughs> with meeting men in public because I really don't want to talk to you. Um, that's just kind of how I am. Like a like, social thing is fine, but like mm -hmm. if you're not connected to any of my friends, I don't want to speak to you, um, and that's just kind of like. Um, of, of how they are. Listen, see, people are crazy anywhere. Okay. Any everybody's anywhere. crazy. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's no difference. A guy in the bar will be crazy. Um, so no, I've definitely used them and I, I would recommend, I think it's for me, it was a good way to meet someone that wasn't connected to my regular social circle, you know, cause like I had dated guys in the past that, that have always been like either in the circle or one, one, you know, notch removed. And so at a certain point you're like, Ugh, I'm, you know, running into my ex again. Hey, cool. Hey, how are you? So it was right. a good way to, to, you know, meet somebody that, that really, you know, we don't have mutual friends. Right. So it's nice to kind of have that, that, that person, um, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely, um, be open, open to the apps, but well, I just hopefully never, uh, I mean, not right now, right. <laughs> um just know hopefully he behaves yes he's, he's behaving well so hopefully i won't have to um but yeah i definitely um i see i i hear good things and i hear bad things let's just say that so, so. yeah i mean it's it's really hit or miss for anything and honestly it like anything yeah and i like to read some of the the funny stories too on the internet of people <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, keep going on those Tinder dates and, and keep posting to Reddit so I can read all of those crazy little things that have happened. Yeah, I, I got to read some of those because I, I don't I don't see anything about I only see the bad things that happen. Like, OK, I mean, that's usually bad, but it's not like a like a serial killer. It's just like, can you believe this person like X, Y, Z? Gotcha. You know, yada, yada, yada. I'm gonna check those out. Got to check them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Ready for some shout outs? People still use Tinder. Yeah, Terrence, I believe people do. I feel, I feel like Tinder's the top like app, actually. I feel like that's the one I hear about the most. Tinder, I think I Tinder. think it's all my friends are on Tinder. I think it's Hinge. Hinge or tin and Tinder. Oh Hinge. What's Hinge? What's that? So Hinge is the one where you can like read like little profile of the people and if you have to like hit a like. And then the person has to accept it and then you can talk to each other. So it, it's, I, th I think that's what it is. So it's that same thing of the Tinder of you both have to like each other. So it's not like one of those like match.com where like a zillion crazy people will be in your inbox. Mm. So okay. yeah. Is Hinge more like serious? Cause like Tinder is just for like hooking up. Right? I mean, I think you get a little everything on everything, right? Okay. Yeah. I yeah. heard Tinder. Ten. I heard Tinder was the hookup app, though. So I'm just. If y'all want to hook up, Tinder is it. <laughs> We're not the experts on this, so don't ask right, us. That's, right. right. That's what I heard. <laughs> We're going to be giving fake advice. So, all right. Well, I think it's time for some shout outs before uh, we hit bedtime. So, B, would you like to start? Shout out to, first and foremost, shout out to Tom for coming on here and just honoring Diane's legacy and telling us things that we didn't even know about her. And just like, I was so in awe of her, um, to be honest. So shout out to Tom. Um, shout out to, you know, our audience, friends and families, everybody who tuned in. Um, and we just, we appreciate you guys' support. And um, yeah, that's all I got. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely shout out to Tom. I, I am looking forward to that book, to, to reading about her. She is a phenomenal person. Got to give my shout outs to, to T and AB and JB and the whole crew over at Chicago Clubhouse Podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you watched uh, last night's episode, but uh, I, I haven't watched all of it, but AB was wearing a ref uniform. <laughs> I'm like trying to do work, like in the side and look over, like <laughs> just as a sexy ref. I'm never going to ref. But. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, I definitely have to watch the beginning of that one. Um, but no, but uh, you know, and shout out to our girl Misha. Um, you know, we we've had a, a a very bad car accident in our flag football community, so. Aaron, everyone is out there. We're rooting for you. You're in everyone's you. thoughts. Um, and you know, your your lovely, your lovely lady, Misha, man, she has been through a lot. You got the, the beautiful baby. So I really just wanted to end it on just say, you know, I'm not really a religious person, so I don't really pray, but anyone that does pray, please pray for for Misha and Aaron. And and on that note, you know, that's just who we want to give our final, our final thoughts with. Definitely, definitely. Definitely prime information, Aaron. And hopefully he's gonna pull through soon. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Y'all have a good night.